Hi, today we're going to talk about how do you apply uh, end user profile as we've looked at different, you know, the choose your markets, we've, we, 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 market segmentation, we're narrowing it down to beachhead market, but now within our beachhead market, we're going to look at who the customer is. And today we have Julia Lazzaro from Task 36, who's here from uh, TU Berlin, which is part of the Global Founder Skills Accelerator, which is where we bring some of the best student teams that are in from around the world here to the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship to work for three months intensively so that they build their skills and build their new venture. So Julia, why don't you tell us a little bit about Task 36? We are developing um, a task management software um, and we want to optimize um, the priority list of your tasks. So um, this means that our tool automates um, the way how you choose the next task that you want to work on. So um, we want to have people um, that have this feeling of firefighting in the dark when they don't know which uh, task they should uh, choose next. And um, the tool is going to always tell you in real time what task you should, be, uh, you should be focusing on to be most efficient. So it's a huge market opportunity because people need to do better project management and use tools for it and some of the new processes. So the, the challenge is, you know, how do you pick, a, uh, how do you pick your t beachhead market? How do you get your customer and really get focused? So Julia's going to ask some questions here in a, Q, a question and answer session about end user profile. So Julia, why don't you start with your first question? Yeah, so we have been uh, thinking a lot about um, which segment we want to address. Because of course everyone could use, uh, could use uh, task management, but it's a broad market and we need to focus on a, on a segment. And we have been thinking a lot about the um, end user profile. What do you think? Is it uh, better to choose one real person at, as the target end uh, customer or should it be an average? So, you know, we love focus. Focus is the key to this. But at this stage in the process, we've just kind of chosen our beachhead. We don't want to focus yet on one specific customer. We're going to do that later in the persona. Right now, we're just trying to get a better assessment. So it's kind of moving down the funnel. So we're going to talk to a whole bunch of customers, but we're going to build a composite now of it's in this region. They're between 14 and 19 years of old. They make this amount of money. They use, you know, they use Samsung. Galaxy 3 phones, so we're going to build a profile. So it's not an individual customer at this point. We're not ready to do that. Uh, in the whole process, we're moving towards more specificity, but you don't want to do that too fast. So right now, we're just kind of moving down the funnel and getting a kind of profile or general composite of what our customer looks like, because in the next step, we're going to see if that market's big enough. Okay. Is there a kind of a difference between B2B and B2C market? Because like, I mean, I would easily maybe find um, like characteristics about um, an end user customer, but B2B, is it a little bit more complicated? So this process started out in, B, in B2B. So, um, and sometimes I get the questions, is it really relevant to B2C? But the B2B, it absolutely is relevant, and the B2C, it turns out, it's relevant as well. But there are slight differences. When you're building the end user profile in a B2B, you start looking at the company first, but then you, you, you don't just say the profile is a company. It's who is the end user or ultimately primary customer in the B2B. So we're going to find out who those people are, and then we're going to see how much budget do they have or how much value do we create to estimate how big the market's going to be. But we're going to build the profile of, of the, you know, the person who's the industrial designer in a firm that's in the toy industry, and we're going to build that profile. But um, when you go to B2C, it gets a little more amorphous because they don't have specific budgets. But it, the same process does work. But it's just a little more challenging because it's a little more blurry around the edges in the B2C area. Um, also, I was thinking, um, I mean, we are, right now we have our team, but um, we're not sure if we really have someone in the team that could be the end user. How important is that? Yeah, th that's a really good point. I mean. Most companies start where the, 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 a representative of the end user is part of the team, but that's not always the case. But if you don't have that person who is the end user in your team, then you better find someone who is very knowledgeable about the end user, or you yourself do a total immersion in it. Because at the end of the day, the, the line between you and your customer should not be a discrete one. You can't be looking at them like, look at that nice animal in the zoo. You know, that's like you don't understand them. Um, you, you want the line between you and them because if you just look at it, and it's, a, it's a demographic on the internet, you don't understand them fully at a rational level and you certainly don't understand them at an emotional level and you certainly don't understand the social. And um, 
you know, my thesis at MIT was about how great companies come about. And how they come about is by walking in their customer shoes and really understanding them all about them. Not just, you know, this makes sense, but what are the social pressures? What are the, um, what are the emotional needs they have? All those types of things feed into it. So you're at risk if you don't have someone on your team who's from your target customer group. You can remediate that by immersing yourself in understanding it and or hiring someone from that group and bring them and make a key part of your team. Okay. A question that comes up when you're speaking about focusing on your customer needs. What about, I mean, if you're always running after the needs of your customers, don't you lose at one point, you know, the innovation process? And like, I mean, I can, I think of like um, things that Steve Jobs or Henry Ford have said, like Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Faster horse right? and buggy, so yeah. So what you don't ask the, you don't say to the customer, what is it, design a product for us. That's what you don't do. What your job is, the, the classic one that I always use is, you know, the Sony Walkman. You didn't go to someone and say, Erdine, what do you want? And they said, boy, if I could take two speakers and put them on my ears and hold them on my ears and walk around on the sidewalk, that would be really great. Uh, that's not what would have happened. But yet the Sony Walkman turned out to be terrifically successful because people wanted a personal entertainment, personal music. So you, you can't ask them to design the product. That's your job. But you can understand what they need, what they want, what their aspirations are, what are the bottlenecks in the process. So the objective of primary observational market research is not to have them tell you the answer. It's for you to figure out the evidence to, to, to solve the riddle as to what might be an innovative product for them. So in that sense, I, I do agree with Steve Jobs. I do agree with Henry Ford. You can't ask the customer what the, what the, you know, what the new product is. But you, and you can ask them what their needs are, but they might not even be able to voice them. You have to observe them and watch that and then solve their problem. Mm. How difficult is that? Like, I mean, you go there and watch their habits, or do you have yeah. like some practical? Yeah, so, so we have someone here at MIT named uh, Elaine Chen who, who worked at an industrial design firm, um, very similar to IDO, it's called Design Continuum. And she taught us a lot about doing ethnographic studies. And you have, to, you have to look at them and watch them and see what they do. And there's a whole process to do that. And it's something that you can acquire. Um, and, and as you know, I remember I did it by instinct at the beginning, but there are people who are very good at that. So it's not easy. It, it, takes, a lot of, um, it takes a lot of work to do that. But nothing is more important than really understanding your customer, because you've got to design the product for them, not what you think they want, but what's the reality. And this old saying is, you know, in concept, there's no difference between concept and reality. So we could sit here and build a concept for someone that made all the sense in the world, but, uh, but in reality, concept and reality are totally different. And then you put it out in the marketplace and they don't do it. You avoid that problem because you understand the customer so well. Do you have an example of a company that is um, focusing very well on, on customer needs and that is yeah. following the strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, the, I, I look at many companies, I mean, um, and, and this is not one of our companies here, but one that everybody knows is Zappos. I mean, here you take a company where the product is a commodity. You can get the same shoes anywhere, but they have figured out and they have customers and they get customers who value their service. They understand their customers so well that people will actually pay a premium for the, the commodity product. And Zappos became an extraordinarily success story that's now copied by many people. And if you look at what they did, they didn't just say, tell us what you want. They experimented, they, they observed customers, they experimented, and they made their customers not satisfied, but very satisfied. And that's your goal, is not to just make your customers satisfied, but very satisfied. And the only way you do that is by being focused, building an end user profile, and then really relentlessly iterating on what it is that, that works for them. Um, another more like practical question. Um, when you have um, the decision take, uh, making unit, yes, and um, okay, you have a user, and then you have of course the decision maker, yes, and he is not at all interested, and you want to like um, you know focus on the on the end user, yes, the champion, yes. What do you do? <laughs> well, you, so you have to when you look through this, you, we're talking about multi-sided markets. You know, which one do you focus on? Do you focus on the economic buyer or do you focus on the the end user? And you know. You, 
everyone says, well, it's a catch-22, you have to have one before you can get the other. Usually when you break it down, you have, there's one who is the primary value creator. And, you know, and that is the one you have to focus on. That's the hardest part of it, because if you get them, then the other people will start to follow. So um, one of the companies we had here was Medium, which we, we have another section, and they had to figure out which was more important. It was the digital art, the artists or the people would buy it. It's a two-sided market. Which one's more important? Is it the artists or is it the buyers? Well, if we don't have the buyers, then the artists won't come. It's the so what Kim and Shambhavi did is they did a lot of market research to figure out if they got the artists, then the buyers would come. Um, so it was a situation that which was the harder one to get and then the other one would follow. And that's what you have to go after first. So it's a difficult question with which there's no singular answer. You have to go out and do, do the market research. But usually one will, if you get one, the others will follow. So in case it might be the economic, the end user and the economic buyer will then follow. And that's usually the case. Have you always done it right? Um, no. <laughs> The, I've done it wrong so many times that that's why I have wisdom. Wisdom is just scar tissue from all the mistakes I've made. And so when you get to be an old person like me, you'll have wisdom, hopefully because you've made a lot of mistakes. And right now we're trying to learn from you. <laughs> well, you. So I, I think if you don't make mistakes, you won't learn. You know, and I tell the story as a basketball player that if I came off the court at halftime and I had made all 20 shots, the first thing the coach would do would come up next to me and start yelling. If I was a coach, I would come up next to me and say, yelling, you didn't shoot enough. Because until you make mistakes, you're not pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know in some places, I don't know what it's like in Germany so much, but a lot of places, you can't make mistakes. Yeah, and that's, you, uh, in Germany, happening it, pretty it, often, yeah. It's yes. like, um, you're afraid of making mistakes. And but in Berlin, it seems like it's more open to yeah, that. Yeah, because this is now the new startup scene in Germany, and it's yeah. um, supported a lot, and yeah. And that's important. You can't, don't, don't fear not getting it right the first time. Try something, experiment. The success is in, you know, bias to action. I, I, I assure you, you will make no mistakes if you do nothing. But I also assure you, if you do nothing, you won't succeed. So make your guess on the end user profile. Get out there and test it and try it. And don't be afraid of making mistakes. But don't make the same mistake twice. Learn from it. That's for sure. <laughs> we try our best. <laughs> Okay. Great. That's Thank it. You. Thank you, Julia. That's a pleasure. We look forward to working with you the rest of the summer. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're learning a lot and um, it's great to, to, to learn from your experience. Great.